Um, thanks to the organizers for the invitation and all of you for coming to this talk late in the day. Uh, yeah, so this talk is sort of a survey of this emerging area called, which I call linear algebraic pseudo randomness. Um, and it covers uh, a bunch of works which we have been doing um, in the past few years. I'll mention the specific things later on, um, but it's with a variety of you know, several people. So roughly speaking, uh, the subject aims to understand linear algebraic analogs of various fundamental Booleans, pseudorandom objects in the Boolean world. You know, you could take extractors, expanders, error correcting codes, and all those things, and where you replace the size of the subsets by the rank of subspaces, and you kind of think about the analogous questions in the linear algebraic world, you get a variety of uh, interesting objects. So, so some examples are codes in the rank metric, expansion in dimension, uh, sets which evade subspaces, uh, things which preserve, linear maps which preserve rank, uh, and the main topic of the talk perhaps is subspace designs. And uh, why we are interested in this is twofold. One is that these things are interesting uh, for their own sake, for inherent interest. Plus, they also have a variety of applications to diverse settings. So you can construct Ramsey graphs, build list decodable codes. Um, they're useful for polynomial identity testing. And these will also come up in Michael Forbes' talk tomorrow morning, um, and a variety of coding applications as well. OK? So, so this talk is about two main objects. One is dimension expanders, uh, which I'm going to define now. And this somehow was, uh, was put forth in an uh, unpublished work by Barak and Pagliazzo Shibulka Vigdorsen about uh, 12 years back uh, as a linear algebraic analog of vertex expansion in graphs. OK, so what's the, the definition? So you fix some vector space over a uh, finite field, f to the n, or it can be any field, but mostly think of finite fields for this talk. And uh, you're going to have a collection of d linear maps from f to the <coughs> n to the f to the n. And you say that this is a B comma alpha dimension expander if the following happens. If you take any low dimensional subspace of F to the N of dimension at most B, and you act on it with all these maps, A1 through AD, and the sum of that, so the sum of those subspaces has dimension which is uh, noticeably bigger than the dimension of B. So it's at least one plus alpha times B. Okay, so is the definition clear? So you can always take A1 equals identity, you will have alpha equals zero, but the idea is to have a few more maps which will expand every subspace. And uh, D is called the degree of the dimension expander. So this is the parallel with uh, vertex you know, graph expanders, expander graphs. And alpha is the expansion factor. Sometimes you can call one plus alpha the expansion factor. But since expansion of one is trivial, let me call alpha the, the expansion factor. So, so you can AI with B, so this is like? You just apply the linear map to the vector space, subspace B, you get another subspace. And what and do you mean by summing subspaces? Just sum the subspaces, sum of the subspaces. Even like union, union yeah. of the basis vectors? Yeah, which the subspace which contains the union, which is the, I see. So the sub smaller yeah. subspace that contains the union. Yeah. So, and that should be at least uh, 1 plus alpha times the dimension. Okay. And uh, you can see the parallel with uh, these being neighborhood maps and the size of the set on the left for small sets have being at least 1 plus alpha times bigger. Okay, that's the parallel with the. Okay, so again, this is the definition succinctly. And again, with, as always in pseudo-randomness, when confronted with something like this, you try a random construction, and random objects are pretty good. So just sample parameters, not tight or anything. But if you take a collection of 10 random maps over any field, um, that will expand sets of dimension up to n over 2 by, let's say, if you know, one alpha will be half. So go up by a factor of 3 halves. Three, would 3 work there? Probably, yeah. I just wanted to be safe and put some 10, yeah. <laughs> Maybe even two would work, yeah. So, yeah, so. Two and So, I'm not sure, but. Uh, but maybe if you change the n over two to say n over 10, maybe two would work. There may, there may be some trade off. Yeah, so. Okay, but crudely, let's think of the following two. So, this is one setting where you want omega n sized dim dimension sets to expand, and you care about the degree being some absolute constant. You don't care what it is. The other thing you can ask is that suppose I pick D linear maps, you can hope for the dimension to be close to D, and you can also achieve that. And for sets, of course, of dimension, say, less than n over 2D. Okay. So both of these are true. And of course, the, the, the challenge is to come close to these sorts of results with the explicit constructions. And a, sort of a good ballpark is this uh, goal, which is that you want constant degrees, uh, dimension expanders, which expand by a constant factor, omega n dimension sets. So linear sized, linear dimension sets should expand by a constant factor. OK, so that's uh, a challenge. OK, so I'll leave it at that. We'll come back to dimension expanders. But now let's talk about uh, 
something called subspace designs, and we'll connect it to dimension expanders later. Do they imply expander graphs by some conversion? Uh, good question. I don't know. Um, so there is a construction of, uh, so in some sense, for example, this challenge is met over fields of characteristic zero, and that uh, indeed is based, I mean, the way it is done, it also implies vertex, it takes vertex expanders and builds these things, but I don't know if there's a black box connection. Okay, I'll have to think about that, yeah. But, yeah. Okay, so slight drift in topic, subspace designs. Okay, so the way I'll talk about this part of the talk, which is sort of the bulk of the talk, is I'll say why we define these subspace designs. Uh, the motivation came from coding theory, and then I'll give the definition, and then I'll talk about a construction. Uh, and then we'll, in the last part, we'll talk about applications, uh, broader applications in linear algebraic pseudo-randomness, in particular, how they relate to dimension expansion. Okay. Okay, so the motivation for subspace design uh, was to reduce the output list size in certain list error correction algorithms for variants of reed solomon algebraic geometry code. So there are various algebraic codes for which you have list decoding algorithms, and these were useful to reduce the list size. So let me say, I don't want to get too much in this, into this connection, but I'll at least give a, I'll try to show how this actually arose. So what are reed solomon codes? So these are a very well known codes which take polynomials of degree less than k and map it uh, to their evaluations at a number of points which exceeds their degree, so you get redundancy. So you take a degree k minus one polynomials evaluated at n places, you get this. And uh, easy property of this is that because degree k minus one polynomial has at most k minus one roots, any two such encodings will be quite far from each other. They'll differ in at least n minus k plus one places, which means if you take one code word and corrupt it in n minus k by two positions, you can still go back to the original message or code word unambiguously. And you can also do this efficiently using a variety of algorithms, and this has been known for a long time. So where list decoding comes up is you try to correct a number of errors which exceeds this bound, in which case you cannot always hope to get a unique answer, but you uh, resort to what is called list decoding where you output all the answers which are consistent with that many errors having occurred. Okay, so that's the, the problem. And uh, so for reed solomon codes, you can list decode them up to a number of errors, which always exceeds this n minus k by two. But it turns out these are not as good as what one can hope for. For example, if you take random codes. If you take random codes over a sufficiently big alphabet, they will allow list decoding up to a number of errors, which is almost n minus k, so which is two times bigger. And that's clearly the, the limit you can go for. And uh, so it's a nice question, so the natural question is, can you do that well? Okay, and Reed solomon codes quite, don't quite achieve that. But turns out we know many explicit, by now some explicit codes which achieve this, and these are twists on Reed solomon codes. So it started with work with uh, three Rudra where we had folded Reed solomon codes, but now, by now there are many other codes and other variants which also achieve this. And a couple of those explicit constructions is what mo motivated subspace designs. Okay, so let me give a little more detail there. So what we did for that is for Reed solomon codes itself, in general, we do not know how to go beyond this, uh, the n minus square root k n bound. But here is a Reed solomon code with a twist, where I take polynomials with coefficients in a big field, an extension field, but I only use elements in the base field as evaluation points. Okay, so the key thing here is the red. The AIs could come from FQ to the M, but I don't do that. I only use things in a FQ. Okay, why do we do this? It turns out for this, uh, and I won't give any details of this, but for this, with chopping Xing, we could give a list decoding algorithm with the following kind of guarantee. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the two important things are in red there. So essentially, for any parameter s, which is of your choice, uh, and if you take s equals one, you'll be back to the unambiguous decoding. But if you take larger s, you improve the fraction number of errors you correct. So as s grows, you get better and better number of errors. But what you promise becomes weaker and weaker. Namely, what you promise is that you will pin down all possible polynomials which could have been sent to a subspace. And that subspace will have the following kind of structure. The ith coefficient of that polynomial will belong to a affine shift of a fixed low dimensional subspace. So basically each of these coefficients must be, roughly speaking, in a low dimensional subspace. And that subspace will be the same across all the coordinates. Okay, I'm not going to tell you why we can get this, but this is something we could prove. And this, of course, means that the number of, you can compute the dimension of the subspace. For each position, there are s minus one dimension. There are k positions, so the number of solutions is something like this. 
but that's too big. Even if you take s equals 2, this is like q to the k, that's exponentially sizeless. If you take s equals 1, you get back your old algorithms. But for s equals 2 and beyond, you're doing something non-trivial, but it's not, the list size is still very big. So we would like to bring down this uh, list size, and uh, that's where subspace designs came about. Sorry, sorry, I'm confused. So you're, you're saying you recover all polynomial, you know, so you'll say you'll errors, but you recover. So you correct more errors, and whatever received word you get, the theorem says that all the code words you need to output will belong to this subspace. I'm not saying all of them will be close by, but everything close by will be in this subspace. Oh, see, that's the thing. So and then, of course, you can go ahead and prune that subspace. But the problem is, as such, it's too big, so you can't do that. So you're saying the subspace is too big, I said. Yeah. So it's, it just somehow says you can pin down the possible solutions to a very structured subspace. And subspace designs are going to help to go further than that. So what are those things? And again, don't. it's not too important to understand this thing. Um, so. Really, the idea with uh, subspace designs is that once you have this, subspace designs with this, we, we will do a pre-coding step where we will say that instead of the ith coefficient being an arbitrary field element, it should belong to some subspace hi. Okay, so this is something we will design, do in the code design. The hi's are part of the code specification. And now it's easy to see that if you have these linear systems plus the fact that fi belongs to hi, the total space of possible solutions now becomes not s minus 1 times k, but it's simply the sum of the dimension of the intersection. Okay, because roughly speaking, in the ith step, you must belong to w. Don't worry about that affine shift that works out. You must belong to w, but you also know you've always belong to hi. So you must belong to w intersect hi. You sum that up over all positions. That's your total dimension. And the idea is going to be to say that you would insist this set is small, uh, or this dimension is small, so that uh, you're Overall space is low dimensional and you can output it. Small means really small, right? Like small should be a constant. Yes, exactly. Because the number of solutions will be q to this dimension. q is like n for Reed Solomon code, so you want this to be really small. So you want to construct a choice so that this is true for every w? Yes. Or you're given w and no, no. So it should be, you don't quite control w other than the fact that it's low dimensional. Okay. So I'll define subspace designs in the next slide. It will be for all them. So, so the idea is that you will insist, you'll pick an hi, set a collection of hi, so that you'll, this is guaranteed to be small, no matter what w is. Of course, you can trivially do that by taking hi to be tiny, but you don't want to do that. You want to keep the rate high, so the hi should be very high dimensional. So they should have dimension almost close to m. So it should be 1 minus epsilon times m, so that the hit you rate, take in the rate is pretty small. So what is the meaning? hi is like the space for each symbol? So yes, there are different, so the ith coefficient should come from a subspace hi. I see. There is one for each position. So the rate will be sum of the dimension. Right. So you each, each position, you lose a factor 1 minus epsilon. So the overall loss in rate is factor 1 minus epsilon. OK. So that's the, OK, even if this connection was a little bit fuzzy, don't OK, worry about it. It's just to say that they come up in a very natural way with this algorithm. So that's, how we def that's why we define them. But here is a definition. OK, so the definition of subspace designs is the following. So you fix a vector space fq to the m. Earlier, I had the extension field, but let's think of uh, with an isomorphism, it has a vector space of length dimension m. So you want a collection of subspaces of this space, and you want all of them to have high dimension or low core dimension. You call it to be an s comma l subspace design if for every s dimensional subspace w of fq to the m, this total intersection is at most n. OK, I had s minus 1 in the previous slide, but we'll just make it s. OK, so that's the thing. And, then, and obviously, you would like this uh, L to be small, and you would like to have a large collection of subspaces. Okay? So you would like a large collection of subspaces which have low intersection power. And now one point is that this might look a bit uh, cumbersome, but the point is this also implies that if you take any, any W, the number of HIs which even non-trivially intersect W is tiny. It has to be at most L, obviously. And that property is something which we call a weak subspace design. And this is a strong subspace design, not just subspace design. Okay, and this distinction is a little bit important. But for intuition, you can just think about this this way. You have a collection of subspaces such that any low dimensional subspace will only intersect a very small number of them. Okay. So we agonized quite a bit on what to call this and somehow called it subspace design. It's not exactly a design in any sense, but okay, so is the definition clear?
Okay, once again, it's a pseudo random object. What can you do? Pick these at random. So again, our epsilon m will be the core dimension. Let's fix a finite field fq. Then if you pick a random collection of about q to the epsilon m subspaces, that's quite a lot of subspaces, uh, you, it, you can prove that that will be an s comma l subspace design where l is only like s over epsilon. Okay, so if s is a constant, then this will also be a constant. As Raghu said, for the application, it's important that l is very small. So even though you have a lot and lot of subspaces, for any s-dimensional subspace, only about s over epsilon will intersect it. Plus, it's a strong subspace design property. And this is roughly the right ballpark um, because, of course, s is a lower bound on l because you can take w to be contained inside h1, and then the dimension of w intersect h1 is s, so you can't do better than s. And it's not hard to see 1 over epsilon is also uh, a lower bound uh, because each of these subspaces is co-dimension epsilon m. So you can basically take w which intersects the first 1 over epsilon of them because each of them is epsilon m linear constraint so you can keep solving. So roughly this is more or less the best. I mean I don't know if this is formally a lower bound that s over epsilon is but uh, uh, I think there's actually a paper which proved that that's, uh, no, actually, no not in this context. but. S plus 1 over epsilon is a lower bound, and we are on the right. And again, if you plug it in this in the application we just said, uh, it will turn out uh, that you can correct a number of errors, which is 1 minus epsilon times the best you can hope for. And the dimension of the solution space, instead of being huge, will now be something like 1 over epsilon squared, which only depends on epsilon. Is okay. it clear that you can efficiently compute this intersection? Yeah, everything is linear algebra. Once you compute these HIs, the, the algorithm is linear algebraic, it will tell you w, everything is just solving a linear system. Okay? But of course, you're right that this, but to construct the code, you need these HIs explicitly. So the big challenge in this to get explicit codes was to find subspace designs with parameters close to this in an explicit manner. Okay, so that's the challenge. And it turns out with the swastik Koparty, we, we got a collection which is more or less as good as the probabilistic construction. So we got an explicit construction which is an s comma 2s by epsilon subspace design. Everything more or less the same as the previous slide. The number of subspaces we got was a little bit lesser. It's not q to the epsilon m but epsilon m by s but that's not, that wasn't so critical. The, the bad thing in this theorem is that we add this thing in red. So this only worked, um, so the construction only works for large fields. So the probabilistic method in some sense doesn't care about the field, works for any finite field. This is only works for large fields. Okay. So this is an explicit construction. I'll tell you a little bit about this construction. Uh, we can also get something over small fields by just working over an extension field and simply mapping elements in the extension field to vectors over the base field. This does work over every field with one important caveat. It takes a subspace design upstairs in the big field, but it makes it a weak subspace design. Somehow it doesn't preserve the intersection dimension, and this is a nuisance. Okay. So, so we can also get this for every field with the weak property. And again, these results have been used to give explicit codes of optimal redundancy for list decoding in a variety of settings, both for constant size alphabets and in the rank metric and so on. And for these applications, somehow this weak property was not such a big deal. Uh, it was important to get a lot of subspaces. The weak was the strong was not so crucial. So for list decoding, you're saying it works? Yeah, it works. I mean, it will still be better. It will give slightly better parameters if it were strong, but the weak was not a problem. Okay. On the other hand, any questions? Okay. On the other hand, the application I want to highlight at the end of the talk to dimension expanders, for that the strongness of the subspace design is actually crucial. Okay. And for that, what can we do? So we have a recent result with Chopping, Xing, and Shen Yuan where we, so it turns out I'll show you the construction in the previous slide that's based on polynomials. And it was not quite obvious how to extend it to work with more general functions. But now we can have a construction based on a cyclotomic function field, which more or less gets you the same thing as the previous slide. Uh, but this s over epsilon, and now there is no restriction on the field size, but that intersection bound instead of s over epsilon is basically s log m by epsilon. So you have pick up an extra logarithmic factor, unfortunately. And uh, that turns out to, if this was not there, we would get constant degree dimension expanders, but because of this now we get logarithmic degree dimension expanders. So I'll come to that part later. So what is a nice open question is somehow to get the clean, tight result for all fields without any caveats. So that's still open. 
And in fact, it's for the dimension of expansion application, it, you don't even have to have epsilon very small. You can take epsilon to be half. So even if you get a collection of m over two dimensional subspaces in Fm, and you don't even need too many of them, uh, as long as you don't pay an extra price here, it will be good. Okay, so that's a good open problem. Any little omega one? Yeah, pretty much any little omega one. Is this also much easier over characteristic zero? Is this, uh, the other proof doesn't seem to, I mean, the proof I'll show you with polynomials doesn't seem to care. Yeah. But the dimension expansion question is easier over characteristic zero. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, so now I'll get to the sort of maybe the technical part a little bit where I'll say what this construction is. Um, so the way we, so I, I won't talk anything about this improved construction because this is, uh, get, gets into algebraic function fields and so on. But this earlier construction, um, I have written it in a slightly different format. So there are a slew of parameters here. So you already saw S and M and Q, but now there's gonna be two more parameters, R and T. So we can get a collection of subspaces of core dimension RT and it gives you a subspace design which has this sort of form. Don't worry about it too much. I'm gonna simplify this in a second. And, uh, and basically, once you have this, you just pick some parameters. Take t to be 2s and r to be something like this. You get the promised theorem. Okay, so, so this is just the way the parameters work. And I'll illustrate the above theorem with actually three simplifications. There is a parameter r here, which gives you a lot of subspaces. Let me just make that to be one. So I'll only give you q subspaces over fq. And I won't quite show the sub strong property. I'll only show the weak property. <laughs> And also, as I said, this construction works only over large fields, but I won't even show you that. I'll only show the case when uh, the characteristic itself is large. Okay, all this. But the idea is this will be enough to illustrate the ideas. Okay? Okay, so again, I've, so I, there's sort of a mouthful here with R and all those things, but really the thing I want to uh, talk about here is this thing. So I have a collection, an explicit set, a subspace design for S-dimensional subspaces with intersection bound roughly ms by t minus s. Okay, and what is t? t is the co-dimension of the subspace. So as you decrease the size of the subspaces, I get better and better uh, intersection bound there. And what else can I say about it? Yeah, and then this works for characteristic more than m. Okay, so this is going to be the idea. Um, okay, let's see this and actually as we see more, stare more at this theorem, the parameters will become a little more natural. So let's warm up with a very simple case when you want a subspace design for one dimensional subspaces. So S equals one. Okay. And further, I will make T also to be one. So now I want a collection of core dimension one subspaces such that for every one dimensional subspace, very few of them intersected. Again, I'm not worrying about the strong property. I'm just doing the weak property. But what does it mean for a subspace, what is a one dimensional subspace? It is simply the multiples of a non-zero point. So what we now want is we want a collection of subspaces such that for any non-zero point in FQ to the M, and I've suggestively called that point P, right? that point should be in at most M minus one of the subspaces you get. And the number of subspaces I should give you is Q. And this, this construction is going to be very simple. Uh, so this is what we do. And really what we are going to do is I suggestively call this P because I want to think of FQ to the M as a space of polynomials of degree M minus one. So let's do that. Let's identify thus with this. So now you want a collection of subspaces such that every non-zero polynomial belongs to few of them. Now the only thing we know about non-zero polynomials of low degrees is that it doesn't have too many roots. So somehow belonging to these different subspaces should have something to do with picking up some roots. And that's going to guide how we define the subspaces. So indeed, here is the collection. For every point in FQ, you define the co-dimension one subspace because this is one linear condition on the coefficients of P, such that it's all those polynomials which vanish at alpha. These are Q subspaces. And uh, this property should be immediate now. Because if you take a non-zero polynomial of degree less than M, it has at most M minus one roots. And it can only belong to H alpha if it has a root. That's it. Okay, and this construction is not new here. I mean, this is called the moment-based construction. It has been used in a couple of places before. Um, an explicit place which appears is in the paper of Gabizon and Raz on affine extractors. But this is well-known construction. 
Okay, this was for t equals 1. <coughs> and again, the intersection bound is exactly m minus 1 because the s and t minus s plus 1 are both 1. What about same s equals 1? Let's go with that. That's very simple, but now larger t. So now I want a lower code, higher co dimension subspace, but I want to improve my intersection bound by a factor of t. Okay? It turns out there's a, if you just stare at this and what we want, this is almost a very natural thing to do, is we're going to change the subspace H alpha to be all those polynomials which don't just vanish at alpha, but vanish with multiplicity at least T at alpha. Equivalently, X minus alpha to the T divides P, which is a linear, which is T linear conditions. Okay? And Again, the proof should be clear. If you have a non-zero polynomial, whenever it belongs to H alpha, it picks up T roots at alpha with multiplicity. So it can belong to H alpha at most M minus 1 over T times. And that's it. Okay, so this, this does the S equals 1 case of subspace design. So this was quite easy. Uh, and now the more general uh, case. Yeah. Is it easy to see that? Uh, the condition of P that has multiplicity T roots at alpha, it's T linear conditions. Yeah, so in this case, we are at big characteristic. So we can just say, I have written it down this way. So maybe now it's clear because P of alpha is zero, P prime of alpha is zero, okay. and the T minus one's derivative is zero. Another way to see it is this X minus alpha to the T divides this. So you can divide P by X minus alpha to the T, and then all those coefficients should be zero, the T minus one. The remainder should be zero. That's another T condition, which is equivalent to this. Yeah. yeah, but if you do the division, it's not clear how you to think of that as a linear operation. It's linear, right? Because uh, linear in the coefficients. Linear it's linear in the coefficients, yeah. But yeah, maybe if this yeah. this is good, then yeah. and uh, yeah, and you can also do it over small fields with Hasse derivatives. So this part would work, but the proof doesn't work for small characteristics. So so, but here, yeah. So again, actually, that's why I wrote, rewrote it this way, as uh, this t minus 1 partial you know, derivatives all vanish. Okay. And it's actually the same construction. It works for any s. And it gives you this bound, which is basically a factor s bigger. Okay, so let's try to sketch this proof. I think I should have time to at least give some idea of it. Okay, so the proof. So let's try to prove this bound. Proof idea. So the proof idea is going to be, again, by the polynomial method. Okay, this is a good example of the use of the polynomial method. So what we are going to do is that suppose there is a W of dimension S. Okay, so it's an arbitrary S-dimensional subspace. And we want to prove that the number of, so to prove W intersect H alpha is not empty, not 0, for at most M minus 1 S by T minus S plus 1 values of alpha. So this, this is our goal. Okay, just restating what we need to prove. So the way polynomial method is going to come up is that for every W, so given such a W, we will associate a polynomial. So with W, we'll associate some polynomial QW. It's a univariate polynomial. Okay. And its degree will be m minus 1 times s, which is the numerator. And then, and this will be non-zero. QW should be non-zero. So essentially, we associate a non-zero polynomial with this. And this step was basically trivial in the one-dimensional case. In the one-dimensional case, W itself was a polynomial. It was multiples of a polynomial. This QW was equal to that P. And now we do this. And, uh, and now we'll just basically prove that if W intersect H alpha is, is not trivial, that implies QW has T minus S plus 1 roots at alpha. OK, so this is going to be the structure. And once you prove this, once you have this, you're done because the degree is m minus 1 times s, and you get this. OK, so this is the structure. And uh, so the key thing is, what is this polynomial qw going to be? So w is going to be the span of s polynomials. OK, so let's say it's the span of s polynomials. So qw is going to be is the so called, what's called the Ronskian, or the determinant of the Ronskian of the set. Okay, 
which is a fairly natural object. So you take this determinant, which is p1x, p1 prime x, p1 <coughs> second derivative, p1 t minus, sorry, s minus 1x. Okay, so it clears the ith column it simply takes the ith polynomial and uh, it just puts in the polynomial, its first derivative, the second derivative and so on. So this is a polynomial. The determinant is a polynomial and it's pretty clear it has degree m minus 1 times s because each of these polynomials has degree m minus 1. It's an s cross s determinant. And uh, the only fact which I'm going to use without proof, um, and it's a very standard fact from you know 19th century and so on, and it's not hard to prove, is that if these are linearly independent polynomials, over fq, then this Ronskian determinant is actually non-zero. Okay, so this fact I won't prove, but it's a standard fact. Is it clear so that it space is independent. Sorry? Space is independent. Yes, yeah, of, yeah. Space is independent. Clear that it's space is independent. No, you mean for the polynomials? Uh, is qw? Yeah. You defined it based on the basis. Right. It only changes it by multiples. Like if you wanted to change the basis, you're doing column operations. Like the derivatives are linear. So you have column operations, you're just going to change. It'll be a scalar in FQ. So yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what you meant by basis. Which choice you did? OK. Yeah, yeah it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But actually, even if it did for the proof, it doesn't matter. For the proof, it's only important it's non-zero. But the point is, any choice of basis will give the same round skin up to a scalar. OK. As a polynomial. As yeah, uh, is it, does this require characteristic? Yes. Yeah. Good. So this is the case when characteristic fq is more than the degree of the polynomials. That's where we used characteristic. And okay, all that is good. So we have this polynomial. It has low degree. So why does it have these many zeros? So maybe it's late in the day. So maybe I'll just say how it why it has so many zeros. But it should be pretty clear it has at least one zero whenever w intersects h alpha. Okay, so let's just see that. The whole matrix is zero, okay? Sorry? The whole matrix is... No, no, the whole matrix is not zero. So, okay. Zero at one, uh, entry Right, at one. so what does it mean if w intersect h alpha <coughs> is not empty, which implies oh, oh. there exists There's a linear, a linear combination. combination. Right, exactly. So there is some linear combination of these polynomials, which has at least t roots at alpha. So if you take the same linear combination of these columns, <laughs> put in x equals alpha, you will get zero because you only go up to s minus 1 derivatives here, and t is at bigger than s. Okay, so I said that a bit fast. Let me just say that again. So you take this particular polynomial. So this belongs to w intersect h alpha, okay, because w intersects. And this is a non-zero linear combination. Now if you take this linear combination of these polynomials, so take this same linear combination of these columns, and you, you put in x equals alpha, Right? So then uh, you will get zero. Right? So or, or rather, this linear combination of these things, uh, yeah. So if I take, let me just write it this way. So pj of alpha is zero, summation beta j pj prime alpha is zero, and so on and so forth. And therefore, when you put in x equals uh, alpha, uh, this determinant has to vanish. Because the corresponding columns when x equals alpha are linearly dependent. Okay, so it picks up one root. But actually, there is a slack here because in H alpha, because this guy belongs to H alpha, in fact, I can go all the way up to summation beta j p t minus 1 alpha is 0. But here, for this determinant, I only go up to s minus 1. So there is a bit of slack, and that's what we exploit to get further roots. Okay, so without doing the full calculation, the basic argument is quite simple. We have this polynomial. What do you need to prove? You need to prove that if you differentiate it once, that will still vanish at alpha. So this, what I just said here, proves that qw of alpha is 0. But we also need to prove qw prime of alpha is 0. So why is this going to be the case? Well, you take a determinant. It's just the way you know chain rule operates. So when you differentiate a determinant, something nice happens. It's the sum of uh, s determinants where you just choose, differentiate the first row, in the second one you differentiate the second row, and so on. And the point is you will never talk about a derivative up more than t minus 1, 
as long as you differentiate only t minus s times. Can you also see by division? Like let's say uh, alpha is uh, x minus alpha to the power t divides p1. Right. Then x minus alpha to the power t minus s plus 1 will divide the determinant. Right. Then right. mm. we take linear combination, it's the same thing. Should Probably, yeah. So, x minus alpha to the t divides the linear combination though. So you don't quite know, right? But can you do the determinant after taking the linear combination? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Some reverse line. I don't know, but yeah, this is one proof and it's not hard. So just differentiate the determinant t minus s times. You will never get a row which has more than t minus, which talks about any derivative more than t minus one and all those things are linearly dependent, okay? I'm sorry if it is a bit quick, but as you can see, it's, there's nothing too fancy going on once you have the idea to take this construction and to think about the round scale. Yeah? Can you say something what this construction would mean in characteristic zero? So it's in the, they're indexed by points in the field, right? Right, so this, ca this construction pro probably just works over characteristic zero, right? So you can actually have inf uncountably many subspaces such that, oh. So I think it just works here. Yeah. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, so now let me briefly mention how we remove these three simplifications I made. First thing is I only gave you Q subspaces. Maybe I want to pick a lot more. And the way you do that is that in, instead of picking alpha in just a field FQ, you can talk about alpha coming from a bigger extension field. You can do the same argument holds. The only difference is now this is not a dimension, co-dimension T subspace, but it's a co-dimension R T subspace because uh, vanishing at a higher field point is R linear conditions over FQ. Okay, that's more or less, that's all there is to it. And you'll get Q to the R by R subspaces because you should avoid, you should take things in a field which is not in any smaller field. Okay, the strong subspace design property, basically it's the same argument. You just have to stare at it closer and do a more careful analysis. The point is if, if you W intersect in H alpha with a higher dimension, then in some sense this matrix is not just singular, it has, uh, its kernel has even higher dimension. In fact, the dimension will exactly be the dimension of this intersection. You can do this argument more carefully, you get it. Okay, no, no real change, no change to the construction, just change to the analysis. And the last point is that we would like to remove this restriction of large characteristic. And there we just change the construction. So instead of saying that you vanish with, I chose this because it's maybe more intuitive to think about, but instead of saying it vanishes with multiplicity t at alpha, you actually say that it vanishes at t different points, which are carefully related. So the point should be alpha, alpha times gamma, and alpha times gamma to the t minus one. So you take these t points, you say you vanish at all these points, and uh, that's the co-dimension t subspace. And the same proof more or less goes through. You have to replace the Ronskian by something which we call the folded Ronskian where in the first place you'll have the PIs, the second step you'll have P1 of gamma X, P2 of gamma X, and so on. So basically these are polynomials which are shifted by powers of gamma. And you can prove the same theorem that linear independence implies that determinant is non-zero and uh, do the argument. Okay, so that's how we do this part. Any questions? So. Okay, and these parameters might look strange, but you just pick the correct value of t uh, and r and so on, you get exactly what I said earlier. You can get a collection of co-dimension epsilon m subspaces where this quantity becomes s over epsilon. And that's the, the result. Okay, any questions? Okay, in some sense that's the most, uh, the core part of the talk we've done with subspace designs. I've told you why we defined them, gave the definition, and I've also told you how to construct them uh, over large fields. I did not say how to uh, construct, well, you can do one thing for small fields, as I said, you can convert strong to weak by just re-encoding things, but I did not say how to construct it directly over small fields because that requires not polynomial-based construction, but function field-based construction. Okay, but now perhaps in the spirit of the workshop, let's go back to the broader theme of linear algebraic pseudorandomness. Okay, and so here is an alternate view of uh, subspace uh, designs, which in some sense was uh, the impetus to th this part. and. Uh, and it, arguably, actually, subspace designs could have been defined from in this perspective it's because it has some nice applications. But here is an alternate view. So we have uh, a collection of subspaces HI, 
of co-dimension epsilon m. So we can think of it as the kernel of a map which maps f to the m to f to the epsilon m. So let's see, instead think of these linear maps. Okay, some of this is a view where we change subspaces to linear maps, that's, that's the power here. And actually in our construction, the maps EIs are very, very simple. So they basically took a polynomial and the linear map was simply evaluated it at a bunch of points or evaluated it or it, its derivatives at a bunch of points, depending on which construction you used. So that was a very nice map. And now comes here is the key uh, point of the connection, which is a simple, just the rank nullity theorem. What is the dimension of W intersect HI? It is simply the dimension of the whole space W minus the dim dimension of the image EIW. Okay. If, if you take this to the other side, it's more apparent it's just rank nullity theorem. So dimension of W is the dimension of the intersection with the kernel plus the dimension of the image under map EI. So I just rearrange that. Why do I do this? Well, because of the following thing. So if this dimension is positive, that is equivalent to saying that EIW has lower dimension than W. Okay. So this point is simple, but let's just do it carefully. So if you have the SL weak design property, what does it mean? You have a collection of maps E1 through EM, but for any S-dimensional subspace, all but L of the maps have to preserve the dimension fully. Because whenever they shrink the dimension, you pick up at least one in the intersection, and the sum of the intersections, or, or the number of things which intersect is at most L. So the nice thing, therefore, an alternate view is that as soon as your subspace design has more than L points, so for this part, it's not so important how big your collection is. As soon as it exceeds L, you have this property. Once you have more than L of these maps, for any low dimensional subspace, at least one of the maps must preserve the rank. Okay? And this notion has been implicit in many works. I don't know the history very well, but it certainly came up in work of Forbes, Saptarishi, Spilka, and so on, and probably Michael will tell more about the history and its connections to other things like polynomial identity testing. So that's lossless rank contention. And I call it lossless because the dimension is fully preserved. A thing which is maybe somewhat newer in our work, and, and this came in work with Michael, um, uh, the connection to dimension expanders, is the lossy version, which is really where we use the strong property. So now what we say is that you take, we can, let's ask how many maps can shrink the dimension by more than a one minus delta factor. Now whenever it shrinks the dimension, this sum, this intersection dimension is more than delta times the dimension. And if the sum of those dimensions is at most L, it cannot be more than delta S, whatever the time is, L over delta S, and that's the constraint. I mean, it's, it's a very straightforward reformulation, uh, but you will see the, the power of this in the next couple of slides. So this is the lossy version. And where now the nice thing is that the, the size of the subspace design only needs to be more than L over delta S. As soon as it's more than L over delta S, some map must preserve the rank up to factor one minus delta. Okay, so this is just a reformulation. Why am I belaboring this point? Uh, it's the connection to dimension expanders. Okay, so, um, so let's recap what dimension expanders was. This is the first part of the talk. So it's again, you have an F, F to the n vector space. It's a collection of d-linear maps such that for every b-dimensional subspace, when, when you act all the maps on it, the dimension grows up by a factor of one plus alpha. Okay, and d is the degree and alpha is the expansion factor. So now we would like to construct this. Okay, so let's see what the idea is. So, so what Michael and I did is that we said we're using the subspace designs, so you can construct these in a sort of a nice black box way. And the idea is basically to tensor and then condense. So the condense as in the previous slide. So what do I mean by tensor? Well, it's a very simple operation. So the specific, I'll show a very specific simple instantiation. So you want dimension expansion in F to the N. So what you first do is that you tensor it with F2. So you basically go to a bigger space F2 to the N. And then you condense back to F to the N. So how do you go to this bigger space in some trivial way? You basically say T1, so you take two maps. T1 of V is basically V comma zero, and T2 of V is zero comma V. So this is two maps, and they give you perfect expansion of factor of two. But of course, it's trivial because your ambient dimension has gone up by a factor of two. So it's just not doing anything interesting. But it says that, okay, if I have more room to expand in, expansion is pretty trivial. So you did that, you got a factor two expansion. But now you have to bring back your ambient dimension to f to the n without botching up your expansion completely. Right? You can lose you know, almost half, but you shouldn't lose half the expansion. Right? So that's the, the idea. Okay, in the second step, you have what you do is that you now take these maps from a subspace design. For, m, for Now your ambient dimension should be 2n, so you take m equals 2n, and you take a subspace design, 
and you don't even have to have very large dimensional subspace because the core dimension is half the total dimension. So you take a collection of M over two dimensional subspaces with associated kernel maps E1 to EM. And your final subspace design, sorry, final dimension expander will simply be to compose these maps. You expand your dimension using the TIs, you condense the space back using the EJs. And the 2M maps is going to be your set of maps. Okay, that's the explicit construction. Okay, so it's a very, so once you have, so let's just see what you need from the condenser. I mean, this step is trivial, so the action is here. And it turns out you don't need much, and certainly what you need, we can already provide with the subspace designs we have. Okay, and suppose the kernels of a, these uh, subspace design form a S comma CS subspace design, where C is some constant. Again, the epsilon went away, so it's basically some absolute constant C. Suppose we had this, and we know that we can guarantee this by the polynomial-based construction. And what I, the little trivial fact I said about this lossy condensing, basically in this setting of parameters, just says the following. As soon as you have at least three C maps in your subspace design, for any S-dimensional subspace, at least one of them will preserve the rank up to a factor of two-thirds. So that's the idea. So you start with the subspace of dimension S over two. You tensor, you make it dimension S, so you go up by factor two, but you lose a factor uh, two-thirds, but that's okay. But two-thirds times two is four-thirds, which is still more than one. And therefore, just the composition will give you, will say that dimension S over two subspaces expand by a factor of four-thirds, okay, which in our language meant alpha was one. -third. And that's it, and the rank, the degree was six times C. So all you needed was like enough linear maps with this property, and then you were good. Okay, this is the connection. So I know there's a slew of parameters here, but really the idea is we can think of the subspace designs as condensing maps which shrink the dim ambient dimension without botching up the rank too much. So what you do is that you expand your dimension by going to a bigger space, condense back, and you still preserve the dimension. And again, the consequences, you just instantiate it with just the polynomial-based subspace design I showed you. And again, it's crucial that it was a strong subspace design. Then you can get constant degree dimension expanders for large fields. Why large fields? Because the subspace design only worked for large fields. Okay, so in some sense, it meets the, the ch sort of crude challenge I said of omega and dimension subspaces expanding by a constant factor for large fields. For small fields, what we can do? Well, we can use the cyclotomic function field-based, uh, AG-based construction, but there we had this S log M, unfortunately. So that means that um, the degree has to be basically, you need, so this C was not quite constant, it was log N there. So now you need log N degree. You can only get log N degree dimension expanders. And this is a bit harder to explain, but you also don't quite expand dimension omega n sets. You only expand n over log log n, okay, which is unfortunate. Okay, so this is what implications. So we get some nice, fairly elementary, simple constructions of dimension expanders, but we are certainly not the first to construct dimension expanders. So in fact, here here the prior work was actually better. So let me tell you about the prior work, which actually got better parameters. Um, which is, okay, and all of these guarantee expansion uh, for subspaces of dimension up to omega n. Okay, so I think Avi Vigderson asked this question, uh, you know, in the, around 2004 or so. I think in response to that, Lubotsky and Zelmanov gave a construction, uh, and he even had a proposal, and they basically proved that that proposal works for fields of characteristic zero. Okay, so it's based on something called property T, and it got constant degree and constant expansion, very good. But it only worked for infinite fields. Okay, and then this was picked up by in a couple of works. So, uh, Dwirsch Pilka basically gave a construction which worked for all finite fields, uh, but, to, but they only got log degree expanders for constant expansion, or you can keep the degree constant, but the expansion is sub constant, one over log n. And they also, in this work, introduced this very nice notion of monotone expanders, which are basically a g notion of vertex expanders where the, adju the adjacency maps are monotone functions. So, it's a very sort of counterintuitive object. But they said that if you had that, then for sort of purely combinatorial reasons, you also get dimension expansion. And they were able to construct such expanders using a Cayley graph on the cyclic group, and they got these results. And then Dwir and Vigderson said that you can get better monotone expanders using some uh, zigzag-like constructions. But what was, but still the degree wasn't constant. And then in a pretty sophisticated paper, Burgen and they have said that you can actually get constant degree monotone expanders using expansion in uh, this it's non-compact group, so it's a pretty difficult paper. But one thing about these monotone expanders, they're a very fascinating notion, but they're a bit of, they're very hard because 
other than this result there is no other proof of even existence of these monotone expanders with constant degree so so i won't tell you formally what these are but basically my view of these things is that it is reducing the dimension expansion problem to a pretty difficult problem about uh, vertex expansion and in contrast our construction works completely in the linear algebraic setting and it's you know our belief i can speak for michael as well that somehow dimension expansion should be easier than vertex expansion so maybe we should directly attack the problem here rather than go through that route Okay, so, so, mm -hmm. The dimension expanders you get from more <coughs> expanders, do they work for every field? They work for every field because uh, this uh, Burge and have constructed it for every field. In fact, the coefficient of the maps were in zero, they were just zero one maps. The, the matrix was zero one. So it works for every field. Yeah. And, and in the reduction is also very simple. It just works by some, you know, you, 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 you talk about rank by some sort of upper triangle type structure. So you just reduce rank to some combinatorial structure, which is why the monotonicity helps. So. All right, so, okay, there's one couple of other things. I'm almost at the end. So one thing is, which is, I believe, not been studied is the trade-off between expansion and the degree. So as I said earlier, if you have d-linear maps, the probabilistic construction will allow you to expand the dimension by almost a factor of d. And uh, this trade-off is probably quite poor in monotone expander-based work, just judging by the complexity of the work, so I, <laughs> don't quote me on this. Um, our construction, at least you can quantify what we do. Uh, we can expand by a factor of about square root d when our degree is d. And that square root comes because the tensoring step gains an expansion alpha by, with alpha maps. And in the second step, you have to shrink by a factor of alpha, and that also takes about alpha maps. So since you compose these things, you get about alpha square maps for expansion of alpha, so that's the, the trade-off, okay? Well, which is not you know, far from the best, but at least it's, it's something. Uh, so a very nice challenge is can one actually achieve dimension expansion, which is linear in the degree, or perhaps even lossless expansion, which is well studied in the vertex expansion case, can you expand with one minus epsilon times t? Okay, I believe these are not addressed, and perhaps new ideas are required. Or maybe our construction can be analyzed better instead of decomposing it in two parts and we can make some progress. Okay, so just last couple of slides. So that's all I will say about dimension expanders, but it turns out there are some other pseudo-random objects you can define. And uh, these are also worth studying and connected to subspace design. So probably it's interesting to this crowd. So let me mention uh, this notion of a two-source rank condenser, which we again uh, defined. And it's I found, you know, I think it's a natural um, uh, object. The original motivation for this was to as some sort of a recursive approach to construct subspace evasive sets. That hasn't quite panned out, but I think the object is interesting in itself. So what is a two-source condenser? So you would like a bilinear map from f to the n cross f to the n to f to the m, such that for any low, low rank sets a and b, if you take a cross b and you see what f does to those things, that rank should be much bigger. Okay, so this is a set of size um, you know, for any sets with rank at most r, this should be the case. What's the two things you can ask for? Well, the most you can ask for is the rank just multiplies. Right? Because of course you could take a and b to be linearly independent sets of size r, so then this has only size r square, so you cannot expand more than this. Or the lossy case, you give a little <laughs> factor of 0.9 slack. So these are two things you can ask. Okay, there's a fairly it has a very nice de-randomization flavor because what is a trivial map which will achieve lossless uh, expansion or like this? I mean, I call this condensing because you will see in a second I want m to be small, but if you didn't care about m, you could just take f to be the tensor product. And this will, of course, be lossless, right? And you don't even need to put any bound on r. But of course, it has m is very big, m is n squared. So somehow the idea is to de-randomize this tensor product, make m a bit smaller while still preserving this sort of rank expansion, at least for low rank sets. That's the challenge. Um, and in some sense, the lossless case is actually quite well understood, it turns out. So here is a lemma which we proved, uh, which is a bit surprising to us, but it's an elementary equivalence, is that suppose you have a bilinear map, it's a lossless condenser for rank R, if and only if basically these maps define a rank metric code of uh, distance at least R plus one. Okay, so basically the kernel of these maps, the intersection of the kernel shouldn't have any low rank matrix. So it's a linear rank metric code of large distance. And this is very, at least for uh, finite uh, fields, this, there is an optimal construction 
based on uh, analog of Reed Solomon codes where you replace low degree polynomials with low linearized degree polynomials and everything just works. And so this is very well understood. Uh, and the best m you can get, the output is n times r. So you can map things to instead of n square, you can map it to n r. And that's the best you can hope for. Um, and uh, that's that. You can also use our approach to get match that. And here instead of tensor, then condense, it's the opposite thing. So you want to, the problem with the tensor product, it's very expensive. It squares things. So what you do first is that you condense both of these sources independently with our condensing subspace design maps. You reduce the dimension, then you apply the tensor product. I won't get into parameters, but if you do that and all that, you get something a little bit bigger, but then you can stare at it and say there are some linear dependencies. You can prune that set. You can also get this NR. So for lossless, things are well understood. So the last thing I'll say, what about lossy case? When say you can lose a point one times the product of the ranks. So here again, you do the random bilinear map. It will say that it will work as long as m is uh, at least n plus. Well, r square is sort of trivial because you want output rank to be 0.9 r square. So at least for low r, the bottleneck is you can hope for m to be order n. So the question is, can you get order n? Okay, so that's the challenge. So the challenge is for small r, can you get uh, a lossy two source, it's a mouthful, lossy two source rank condenser with output length linear in n. So we don't quite know how to do that explicitly. Uh, we can again try our condensed then tensor approach, right? You know, where we in the condensing step we are lossy, but unfortunately that we're not able to get any benefit, that also only gives us NR. So this is a nice question which would be nice to answer. Okay, so this is another pseudo-random object, seems to be connected to the web of objects, but we can try to get it. Okay, so I think I'll end on time. Um, so again, to summarize, there is uh, sort of a theory of pseudo-random objects dealing with uh, rank of subspaces and so on. So, and subspace design was one such object which seems to be uh, a useful construct which connects up many of these uh, different objects. And its original motivation came from coding theory. And in fact, the construction, curiously enough, was actually based on very similar polynomial codes which actually inspired their definition in the first place. So there are a lot of connections with uh, coding theory as well. So that's the thing. And there are many open questions, as you can imagine. There are, these objects are sort of relatively newly defined. And none of them are ever opti truly optimally constructed. Right? You can always hope for improvements. So for subspace designs, you know, we haven't quite resolved it for small fields. So constructing good subspace designs over small fields without that log n, log m penalty in the intersection bound will give you also dimension expanders in a clean, simple way for all fields. And the last thing I mentioned for two source condensers, you can try to construct them explicitly. Uh, and one thing I didn't talk about in this uh, talk is this notion of subspace evasive sets, which is another pseudo-random object. It's a large set such that for any low dimensional subspace, very few points lie in that low dimensional subspace. Okay? So again, this is also something we proposed in motivated by list decoding, and later, later Dwyer and Lovett gave a construction, but uh, the intersection bound size is, had exponential dependence on the dimension, so they're also getting close to the random construction is wide open. Be nice. And if somebody wants to know the definition of that, I can tell you offline. Yeah, thanks. Questions? Uh, so the construction you described here uses single variate polynomials. Yes. Uh, do multivariate polynomials come up? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, the function field based things is multivariate uh, polynomials, but you don't evaluate. I mean, it's not, the dimension is still one because it's on a curve. So I'm wondering like, whether Bazoo's theorem or some theorems along those lines come up. Um, yeah, I don't know. It seems pretty, you know, somehow it seems like a one dimensional object. So we have these function field based constructions. So as polynomials, they are multivariate. But um, yeah, but it's still some sort of one-dimensional object. That'll be yeah. I don't know. So. I mean, there, there are like multivariate Roscans, and you can do these sorts of things. But part of the problem is like you get better parameters when you do one-dimensional stuff because if you have a univariate polynomial, you can say there's a finite number of roots. Yeah. But once you start talking about the multivariate polynomial, it's hard to say that like there's a, a small number of roots. The roots grows a lot. If you have two polynomials, Bayes' theorem gives you a bound number of zeros, provided they have no common factors. No, I know that, but like. I mean, so you could imagine yeah. one That's right. So I was going to say you can imagine defining two Ronskians and the intersection meaning that both of them vanish or something. Sure. I mean, but we don't know. But that'll be interesting.